hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of A Certain Age, O-A-C-A, or what we like to say, Awaka. I am your host, Steve V, and my partner, co-host, Cody Maurice Doggett. How are you, Cody? I'm so wonderful. I'm so excited for this next chat that we're going to be having. I love this woman and her book so much, Diana Cocosa. She's going to be life changing. And I can't wait to get into these topics. Right. And I love a book that has kind of a workbook aspect to it because it's not like you just read it and put it down. It's a read and jot down some things. And it's the beginning of the year. I couldn't think of a better time to read some a few chapters and then take that time. I feel like you could be reading other books while you're reading this book, because this is one that you're going to want to absorb. And then you're going to want to write down mm. those exercises in there. I started doing it, but I'm going traveling soon. And I'm, I'm going to take this. This is on my iPad. And it's definitely going to be something that I'm going to be implementing. But like I said, it's you really do want to do some of those exercises to to become more and i think that's really what we're all trying to do is become more and one of the things i think you're going to be surprised about is a lot of it has has to do with the language that we tell ourselves and the language that we impart also the energy that we take in and what energy are we actually putting out there and sometimes that seems simple, but it's just really a re- reworking of our minds. Oh, yeah. It's so in-depth and it's so transformative. The way that we speak to ourselves and the way that we treat ourselves, really, it's such a mind-blowing thing. And it really makes you wonder how growing up you could have absorbed all that language and how it actually molded you. And now you can take actions like we were talking about, about the book that we're going to be discussing in just a moment about how actionable and we can make these changes in order to transform our lives. And that's what it's all about. It's so funny you say, because when we are growing up, it seems as though everything is set in stone and you're right. Language can be such a part of those early years, but you know, in her book, I don't believe we talked about it in the interview, but when I was reading about it, she talks a lot about how she looked at two different types of children that came from the same gene pool and the same parenting yet Mm -hmm. one if you think that it's all about your genes there's story after story of one child actually thriving and becoming super successful and the other one hasn't and it's it doesn't always have to be set in stone the blueprint that you were given at birth and how you grew up but you can change a lot of these things through energy and through your mindset and ultimately through the language that you tell yourself and the stories you tell yourself. So it's very exciting. And wow, I mean, let's just get into it with Diana. Let's get into it with our interview with Diana Kokoska. Cody, very excited today for this interview. We are going to be really getting into it. And I'm talking about our special guest, Diana Kokoska, who wrote a very compelling book that you can apply to your life. It's called Becoming More. You can't get to better until you get to different. Diana, welcome to Of a Certain Age. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for this opportunity. I'm so excited to get to know you guys better and to help our audience by adding value to them. Exactly. Yeah, sounds and great. Diana is an award winning entrepreneur, former CEO and business leader, a practitioner of neuro linguistic programming, which we definitely want to ask about, and a founding member of the John Maxwell team of certified coaches. Her dedication to developing leaders and encouraging individuals to recognize and harness their innate potential has made her a prominent figure in the industry. And I started reading Becoming More, and I'm already 
already compelled with this book and cannot wait to apply so many of the principles. I also think of it like a workbook because you have so we're going to get into all those, but just to start off, can you just share what was the moment or what made you write this transformative book? What a great question. First of all, as CEO, uh, many things were happening in real estate. The economy was going down in 2008, 2009. And the president of the company said, you need to write a course. I went, okay. So I decided to call it Bold, Business Objective, A Life by Design. Now, fast forwarding, 175,000 agents went through that course and I received over 80,000 letters saying it transformed in their career, helping to keep them in real estate, allowed them to make more money. Well, when I stepped down from being CEO, many of them started texting me, giving gratitude, and they would always end with, when are you going to write a book? And I kind of ignored it, Stephen Kane. I really just oh. thanked them for their kind words. And I said, you know what's interesting? And I said, Cody, I apologize. I said, Kane, it's Stephen <laughs> Cody. See, I'm going to demonstrate to you how you can make a mistake and correct it. That's what life's about. And I was making a mistake because I kept telling the people, thank you for your kind words. Keep going. You know, love you. That kind of stuff. And well, one night I got one of those texts. This had been going on for about two years. And the text once again said, thank you for changing my life. I so appreciate you. Here's a picture of my last accomplishment. It wouldn't have happened without you. And by the way, when are you going to write a book? I thanked them for their kind words, went back to the book I was reading. As I turned the page, there was John F. Kennedy's quote, wow. if not us, who, and if not now, when? Yes. And I, I went, that quote. okay, I got it. And with that, I had been doing research about the brain since I was a young child because my brother and sister both had brain tumors. And I wanted to know more about how to help them. Well, I thought, let's get the research out, dust it off, and start meeting with medical people again and going through brain scans and learning more and more about how I can help people. And I'm a big person that believes that you learn more from seeing and, re you know, seeing it, hearing it, writing it. And so I do models a lot. And every chapter of this book has a model, more importantly, the being to becoming more model gives us a blueprint, a step-by-step -step guide to follow. Wow, that is so beautiful. And your story is so compelling. So I love that you are out here helping people. And it actually reminds me of something that I, I think is in, that's in your book. And it's about becoming a creator, a crusader, and a champion of your own narrative. How has this actively affected individuals that you have come out and you've helped? Well, mostly it has been the fact that, you know, when we're small, when we're little, as we're growing up, no one ever says you're responsible to write your own story. And so it's helping them understand that the story they're living is one of two stories. One is it's a, a life by default or it's a life by design. And default means that you're just going with the environment. You're giving what people are giving to you. You're, you're letting them write your story. And mm -hmm. most of those stories end up serving other people. Whereas I believe we've got to take a stand for our own greatness and stand for our greatness more than we stand for our limitations. Therefore, we've got to pick up the pen. We've got to help create our own story. And more importantly, we've got to be the main character in that story, not mm. being in a supportive role, even though we will support other people, yet it's our story. And if we become the main character, then it's easier to be the crusader and the champion of that own story. Let us be our own hero, right? 
I love that as well. So inspiring. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I'm on page 73, you say the way you tell your stories affects your mental health and overall well-being. But you also say the story you tell yourself. And, you know, I just know from experience that I put a positive I just set an intention every day and it's been very helpful for me, whether it's the beginning of the year or even the day, but also there's times when I will have, I will question where I am in life. It's just natural that, that voice comes into your mind and I'm sure we can all relate to that. What's some tips that you can give that are either in the book that when you do have those self doubts, even though you know the right tools, how to get those those nasty voices out of your mind? Oh boy, we all have them, don't we? Because growth is a journey, and it's often uncomfortable. It's not pleasant to fall short, and it's difficult to leave the familiar, that comfortable, to going into the uncomfortable zone. And when we do that. I believe we have four storytellers that we allow to live in our heads rent-free. And one is the devious storyteller. That's the one that you're listening to when we have those doubts. It's the one that tells us we're not good enough. We can't do that. Oh, you're going to make a fool of yourself. Are you kidding? People will laugh at you. It's the one that always wants us to look good and be right. And it plays havoc. It will not even let us go to sleep at night. It reminds us that we should have said this. We should have said that. We should have done this. And I say, if you just keep using that word should, then you're just going to should all over yourself. And you have a should be life, right? (laughs) The second storyteller, though, is one that's equally bad. It's the one that's the flattering one that has people believing that they're better than everyone else and they should be served and they have this entitlement attitude. And that flattering storyteller makes them believe that other people are there to serve them. The third one is the one that scares me quite a bit because we hear this one coming out in many people's stories. It's called the reasonable storyteller. It's the one that gives us excuses. It allows us to blame others for the state that we're in. And it says, don't take responsibility because it's never your fault. Now, all three of those are going to limit our story. They're going to limit as to the character that we can play. The one that I love is the empowering storyteller, the one that literally empowers us and allows us to empower others. It's the one that will liberate our story. And that empowering storyteller, we've got to feed. It's kind of like, which of these storytellers are you going to feed? Because that's the one that's going to grow. Well, the empowering one, we're going to feed it with I am statements. I am good. I am a person that loves other people. I am a person of worth. I do have a lot to offer the world. And whatever else you want to say, I offer a hundred affirmations to feed that empowering storyteller on our website, becomingmorebook.com. So I think giving those declaration statements, those affirmations, One that I use every day is what I believe about myself is what I will become. So I believe the very best of myself. I like that one. Me too. It reminds me of something that RuPaul would say on her show. I'm a big fan. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) It's, it's, It's about beating back the inner saboteur inside of you. So that sounds very familiar. It seems like that alignment is something that a lot of people have and a lot of people can benefit from that positive language that you speak into yourself. I think it's just beautiful. Thank you so much. No, I, and I love hearing about that. Yeah. Well, I have another question. Can About the four energies of success, how do these energies affect individuals and how can it help them achieve their goals in life? Well, the four energies of success are very, very important because, see, I 
Well, I took a lot of physics classes. I worked in the physics lab and I learned that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be transferred or transformed. And therefore, we're transferring energy all the time. It's like walking down the street and your cell phone rings. How did it ring? Well, because energy, it was broadcasted to ring to that number and that number only. Another way to say it is a radio station or Spotify. Whatever you put on, that's what's going to come out. You can't turn to 98.5 and get what's on 104.7. So your energy is what you are transmitting all the time. And people can actually pick up on that energy and you attract the energy you're sending out like attracts mm. like. So the four energies of success, one is intention and purpose. When we're intentional about doing something and we are driving towards that and we make certain that we have a plan that we can follow, well, that's intentionality at its best and the energy starts flowing. And then that energy of confidence where you know whatever happens, even if you fail, you will learn a better way. It, that confidence that you just know that you're going to do whatever it's going to take. You're going to learn from whoever you can to help you get there. And of course, the energy of gratitude is the one I absolutely believe in the most. It's where you get up every morning and you give five things that you're grateful for. And every time that we start thinking negative, we think of things that we're grateful for because negativity and gratitude cannot live in the same mind. And then, of course, being in the present moment, not getting stuck in the past or concerned about the future, just right now. What can I do right now to be my very best? And that energy is going to come out. Now, I just want to share something about gratitude because I love okay. it. That's, I was able to go and uh, see the brain scans and that they brought 30 people together. And what they did, Steve and Cody, is they put all these folks in a room with a piece of paper and pen and you write as fast as you can for five minutes about all the things you're grateful for, your house, your car, the clothes that you wear, the food that you eat, water pressure, hot water, whatever you can think of. They waited 30 minutes and then they did brain scans. Everything in the brain was lit up the creativity center, the intuition, the amygdala, which has happiness and joy as far as emotions go, the learning center, the logical parts of our brain. And it was so interesting to look at. They took the same people back and they said, what if, what if your dog died? What if you lost your job? What if you were diagnosed with a terrible disease? And they didn't have him write it down. They just had him think about what ifs. They did a brain scan. The only thing that was lit up was anxiety, stress, and the depression area of the brain. There was no creativity, no wow. intuition. And I think that alone, plus gratitude, thinking about it, it, it releases endorphins into our system that makes us happy and makes us feel good. So that, that one's the big one. I'm just going to keep emphasizing to people when it comes to energy, think gratitude and everything in your life changes. I love, love that, that so much. Gratitude Me is too. so important and it's spiritual in many ways for some. And it's an intention that I try to set every day. I it, think the higher power, and it could be any power that you believe in, but I set an intention every day of first thinking and having gratitude. And it's a peaceful moment that I have in the morning to myself. And then I set my intentions for the day. But I'm so glad you, you focus on gratitude. It's so important. When you talk about energy, and we've had guests talk about energy healing and the power that energy has. And it is really important who you have in your lives and you write in one of um you write on page 51 who we hang out with matters you will become like your friends and 
I know a lot of us have cultivated friends throughout the years and we can't just drop people left and right if they're not serving us right. But what do you mean? <laughs> well, you could. And, I mean, you could. <laughs> yeah. I and, and to be honest, I did a deep dive with my friendship circle a couple years ago with some friendships that really were... I wasn't feeling good about myself and I'm sure I played a component in that process, but I tell you, I feel so much better with my current circle of friends. Can you just talk about that and who we hang out with really matters? Oh, Zig Ziglar taught me that a long time ago. Who you hang out with does matter because uh, you will become like them, right? That's right. the biggest part. Uh, They'll help chart your course. And I so appreciate you talking about that because it's challenging to give up friends. Yet if they are not helping you, if they're not helping to bring out your greatness, sometimes friends, well, they can be a little jealous. And they right. don't mean to be that way, I'm certain. I believe everybody is being the very, very best that they can at any given moment. It's just, we've got to watch out for ourselves. And if we don't want to be like them, then we definitely have to find some new friends, right? Definitely. What, let me ask you, what what made you realize that maybe they weren't the best people to hang out with? I think it was a negativity that I was feeling. And well, the group that I'm thinking of right now had traditional jobs and I was really embarking on my podcasting career, which has really turned into a career. And it, it was always that reference that, oh, when are you going to get a real job kind of reference that made me feel as if, well, no, no, this is my real job and career. And while you might not take it seriously, I certainly do. And I know I'm not in positions, traditional positions like you all have, but it was just not supporting, I think, what I was pursuing. And, you know, now I have people that do. You know, do you, do we think sometimes that our values being different than other people? Um, I believe that those values of our friends if, if we're not in alignment, we can have different beliefs and get along really well. Yet if we have different values, like the podcast, see, I value the fact that that's what you desired to do. And it is a great career. And look at how many people you're helping every single day. And I believe we'll always get paid in direct proportion to the people we serve. I've always mm. felt that way. Wow. That's I don't deep. know about you. Don't you feel good by helping all the people you're helping? I, we oh, definitely always. do. Yes, absolutely. And we hear it from our listeners. Well, and so if your friends aren't valuing the fact that you want to serve other people, then your values are a little bit different. And if they're different, then we don't feel as good around people that don't honor our values. We work to honor theirs and we kind of like that same respect, or at least I do. Oh yeah, I totally agree. Uh, if you if you have friends that don't support you, then why are they your friends is the question that I want to ask. You know what, isn't that the truth? Because a friendship means so much. In fact, I think one of the best roles you can play is a friend. I think it's oh, yeah. an honor to be called a friend. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have a quick question about your neuro linguistic programming. I don't know why that was such a struggle to say. <laughs> 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 How do you use utilize it in your coaching? And what exactly is it? Well, first of all, it is a tongue twister. I've got to tell you, if you said <laughs> you. it five times real fast, all of us would have problems. In fact, I was speaking in Florida just yesterday to a, a large group of people, and I did the same thing. I said, NLP, let's just well, call it that. And of course, that makes we, it all easy. Laugh. we all laugh. It's Perfect. literally the language that we use. 
It's the way that we can help our brain and train our brain to a new way of thinking. And by the way, one of the things that just came to me is it was a quote by W. Clement Stone when we were talking about friends. And it, it didn't come to me till just now when you were talking about NLP. Be careful of the environment you choose for it will shape you. Be careful of the friends you choose for you will become like them. Mm. And so when we look at those words, that was so eloquently said. That's a little bit of the way that we speak in NLP is how can we touch the heart? How can we help somebody to move through some of the things that are holding them back? Some of the language techniques that you use, for example, uh, you can use embedded commands. Embedded commands in language would be much like our parents used when they said, take out the trash. They didn't go take out the trash. They said, take out the trash. And if you are not listening to them, they said it louder with a bigger downswing. And I knew when my parents went, take out the trash, I knew they were upset because mm -hmm. that bigger that downswing and the louder it got, the more I knew I better do what they said. So knowing that people listen and their brains open up to that, we can use downswings to emphasize things. For example, this is a great podcast. Listen to this podcast. And when we do that, our brain opens up a little bit better. And just by listening to this podcast automatically means that you will become better. Now, we all know that it doesn't automatically mean that, yet our brain takes it in. The other part, that's just language patterns. The part I like about NLP is like what I did yesterday with the lady on stage. I asked the people in the audience who would like to overcome a limiting belief that you have. And of course, this lady raised her hand right away and I said, well, great, come on up on stage. And she did. I took two pieces of paper. One was labeled context and one was resource. And I had her step on the context piece of paper and recall the time that she had a limiting belief. And it was around taking a listing on a home. It was had grown to the fact that she wouldn't even go to help sellers. She only wanted to work with buyers when it came to real estate. So she described the time that happened when she had that belief stick in her head really hard. And she actually got pretty teary eyed as she was telling us about it. So I pulled her off that paper, had her spin around a couple of times, asked her some fun questions, had her spell her name backwards, that type of thing, just to clear her mind. Then I had her go to resource, a time when she was so happy and she felt so confident. And she literally went back to sixth grade when she had won the Smile Award. And they'd actually uh -huh. made this award just for her. It was the first time anybody had won this award. And she was telling everybody. She was telling her aunts and her sisters and brothers and her mother. And they were saying, what's the award? And she goes, they made it just for me. Tomorrow I'm going to get the oh. smile award. You have to come to school and watch me. And as she told it, you could just feel the energy in the room just going up. So I had her go back off the piece of paper and then, of course, turn around, do some fun remarks and get back on context. Tell us about when you were at the listing. She told us again, only this time she didn't get teary eyed. She got a little bit better. Well, to make a long story short, we went back and forth until that moment I could tell that she was there and she was laughing when she was telling us about the smile award. And she even told us the thing I was so excited about is I thought when I get this smile award, maybe I can even get a boyfriend. And of course, oh, right. we all laughed. <laughs> I had her go right from that piece of paper resource and step back on context. And I said, now you're in that home and what are you going to say and what are you going to do? Well, she told the story completely different. Mm 
And she said, I am not going to cower down. I know I can talk to these people. I know what it has to take. And I am going to take listings. Well, the whole crowd was standing up, cheering. I mean, it was so fun. And I got an email from her this morning already saying that she was calling to see if she could take some listings to find a seller that she could go out on a listing. Wow. That is so beautiful. I love that. Beautiful. I, I just love, love when people are empowered. That's such a great story, Diana. Thank you so much. I, I kind of also want to know how neuro NLP, we're going with NLP, right? <laughs> <laughs> how they contribute to the themes that are outlined in Becoming More. I think the biggest thing that you're going to find is in some of the models to help us work through things. You'll find it used for example, in perspective, I use a technique called the three chairs. And when we're having an issue with someone, we sit in the chair called self and we can explain the situation to someone else, or we can explain it to ourselves. Just yet yeah, talk out loud. So you're kind of, thinking this thing through in a vocal sort of way. And then you go to the second chair. That's the person that you're having an issue with. And you sit in their chair and you go, wow, what is it like to be in their shoes, so to speak? And you look at that same thing that happened that you're upset about and you go, what were they feeling? How did they feel? What were they going through? After saying it out loud that way, you go to an observer chair. And the observer chair, you look both at the self and the other person and you go, hmm, as an observer, what do I think is happening here? And then you can go back to the self chair and say, next time this happens, this is what I'm going to do. Now, it works best if you have someone going right through the book with you, asking you those questions. It becomes very clear. I used it many times when I was a CEO with people that were having issues with other people, because we always do, just different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting what happened, because once they went through this, they realized how they could alter their story. They could alter their thinking. They could alter the words that they chose. They could alter their feelings around the situation. And taking both people through it, it really did help people see where each other were coming from. It's another NLP technique. Uh, there's things that if I start down that path, we could get really in the weeds and I don't desire to do that. Yet I desire to have everyone understand that no matter where we're at, we can always become more. And there's different techniques and models that we can use to help because we can blame our environment all we desire. Yet it really is up to us because we have to grow within or go without. And growth is the only opportunity that tomorrow is going to be better than today. So we've got to work on ourselves. And as we work on ourselves, it seems like everybody else just starts getting better. Wow. That is so true. I think one of the greatest things about Becoming More, your book, is you've got it's like a workbook and you have exercises, not in every chapter, but in most of them. And you can put apply a lot of the lessons into your own life. And one of them you have is, and this is interesting, I've never thought about, but the start with the end in mind. I'm, I do love uh, graphs and looking at the bigger picture and start with the end in mind, write your eulogy, you say, reduce it to what you desire to be known for. And it could almost sound a little morbid, actually, but really, if you put your whole blueprint of your life and what do you want to be known for, I think it's such a great exercise for those that may be stuck. Because what if you want to become more, but you don't know what that even looks like? Where do mm -hmm. you begin? I feel like some of these exercises will help you at least look at your life and figure out what it is that you have to offer. Am I right on that? Or are you correct? Oh, me? you are spot on. And it is a little more, but I do understand that. Yet 
let's think about this. So many people have a to, to do list, right? And they love to check it off. Yet, how many of us have a to be list? Or better yet, a to become list and to look at it every day. I did the eulogy exercise myself many, many years ago, and I reduced it down to two things. I want to be known for to have someone say at my funeral, she made a difference by adding value to others. Very simple. And at 7 a.m., my phone goes off with an alarm that says, what will you do today to add value to others? And at 7 p.m., it goes off and it says, what did you do today to add value to others? And it keeps me on a quest because, see, if I get in a car and I start driving around, well, that's kind of weird. I'm just wasting gas and wasting time and making my tires to where I'll have to buy them faster, right? Right. No focus, but right? I got to know where I'm going. And so if we don't know where we're really going in this life, and, and better yet, what are we known for right now? And is it what we desire to be known for? Are we living a life that we're going to leave a legacy that we're really proud of? Because we are going to leave a legacy. It's just, what is it going to be? Why don't you choose it now instead of letting someone else choose it when you pass away, right? Yeah, it's true. Wow. That's that's so mind changing. And it, it really brings to me how, again, we can push back those negative thoughts. What are some ways that we can turn around the limiting thoughts and, and in order to accomplish breakthroughs instead of breakdowns? Oh, I love that question. You know, I think we all tend to play the comparison game. And especially with social media, they call it social comparison. And instead of comparing ourselves to others, I believe we should be comparing ourselves to our potential. Because when we do that, we see that there's always room for growth. There's always room for impact. There's always room for us to be able to influence other people. When we start watching the words that we use, for example, uh, I coached many people. And in doing so, I got to hear their words. There was one lady that she would go, oh, Diana, this happened this week and I was so depressed. Oh, it was so devastating. And it seemed like every week there was something she was depressed or devastated about. And so I stopped her and I said, you know, I, I do understand because let's face it, to have people trust you, they've got to feel like you understand them. And I truly wanted to understand. And I said, Wow, that, that's just got to be challenging. And I'm going to ask you to change the word depressed and devastated to I'm working through this. Ooh. This happened to me and I'm working through it. And then let's figure out how we're going to work through it. Step by step, I'll be here to help guide and direct you. Well, I got to tell you, this lady's production started going up. Her bank account started going up. Her career started taking off. And just that one little thing, because the words helped change her mind. And her mind helped change the thoughts, the story, everything that follows, your beliefs, your values, your mindset. And the interesting part is the words that we use actually help us. For example, there was a study that was done that showed that if you use the word I, me, my, and mine, it actually plays havoc on your heart, that it helps to bring on your heart disease. And oh, wow. we played a game yesterday in the workshop that I did where we took, it was play $100 bills, you know, that you buy on Amazon. And so they got three play bills and Every time they used the word I, me, my, or mine, they had to give them up. So everybody stood up. They went around talking. Oh, my goodness. You couldn't believe how quickly Steve and Cody, these people, had to sit down. How often do we do that? And that was a Harvard study that showed just those words alone made a difference. And Dr. Andrew Newberg of Thomas Jefferson University and Park, uh, Mark War, uh, Robert Waldman 
who is an expert in communication, wrote about the power of words. And just by holding a positive and optimistic word in your mind, you stimulate the frontal lobe activity, which means you're helping yourself to move into action. Mm. You will take action faster just by concentrating on something that is positive. I just think that's so exciting to know. It really is exciting. The power of, I love language. I love communication. I just love the fact that you said, depressed because it's such a end heavy word and it stops at you could practically put a period after it and it's heavy versus I'm working through this I'm gonna I was feeling a little down recently it was that January end of month blues (laughs) several days of grayness outside here in New York City and just the feeling of that winter blues coming but I'm going to switch to that language. I'm working through this because it's so much, it's so powerful. And I I do believe in that neuro thing that happens in your brain. I just love the work that you're doing and the research that you've done on this, Diana. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much. And I know that we have heard some success stories, but I am a very greedy person. So I just want to hear (laughs) more and more success stories about how this has affected people's lives out there in the world? Well, the biggest thing that I can tell you is it's mostly the success stories. You hear about achievements, you hear about the money they've made, the investments that they finally were able to do, you know, that they they love that they realize they had three choices in life. They give up, they give in, or they give it all they've got. And they were willing to do that. Yet to me, the biggest success story is to have people have confidence in themselves, to not believe what the world wants them to believe about who they are. And because every one of us have judgments, our brains are judging machines. We walk into a store and we like this. We don't like that. We we watch television. We like this movie. We don't like that movie. We're just judging machines. And yet... To allow somebody else to judge us, to judge ourselves, to have this book help people realize that they can become more, to realize that it doesn't matter what people say. I loved what um, Deion Sanders said when he said, you didn't make me, so you can't break me. Wow. Why why do we allow people... To literally put words, to put labels on us, to tell us who we are. I want to rip those labels off. Nobody should have labels in this world. We, the label should be magnificent, wonderful, a miracle. Albert Einstein said it best. I loved his quote where he said, you could live life one of two ways. Either that everything is a miracle or nothing is a miracle. And to me, just getting up every day is a miracle. So don't put a label on me about what I can and cannot do. Oprah Winfrey, they wanted to put a label on her. They wanted her to change her name. Are you kidding? They said nobody would ever remember the name Oprah. Are you Mm -hmm. kidding? Now, everybody knows Oprah. And when I met Oprah, I said, thank you for not changing your name. Thank you for not allowing them to put a label on you. Right? Michael Jordan. I mean, greatest of all times. He's got that goat word, right? He didn't make the high school basketball team. They put a label on him that he would never be a good basketball player. Well, he didn't put that label on himself. He did put in his locker the list of the people that made that high school basketball team and his name wasn't on it. And he said it drove him to be better. It drove him to work for that 1% better. It drove him to be consistent in his workouts and everything that he did. He put a label of magnificent. He put a label of I can become more. And that's the label that I desire to give to everybody because they do deserve to become more. They do deserve to have all that they can have. 
And I, I just want to say to everybody that's listening, may you continue to become more as there are countless people eagerly anticipating the full expression of your greatness. You have a gift. The question is, will you open it up? Wow. That Diana is amazing. Kokoska. You spoke directly to me. Diana Kokoska, the book is called Becoming More. You can't get to better until you get to different. Love it so much. Thank you so much. You've imparted so much great wisdom and the energy is real. We're feeling the waves, the energy coming yes. through these speakers. Thank you so much. How Thank can you, people Diana. follow you, Diana? Where do, should people be directed? Well, they can follow me on Facebook at Diana, D-I-A-N-N-A, Kokoska, K-O-K-O-S-Z-K-A, or on Instagram, Diana.Kokoska. Becomingmorebook.com is another place, or moretraining.com. In fact, I'm having a great event in Nashville where you're going to be able to learn to become more. John Maxwell's going to be there. Amanda Holmes with the ultimate sales machine. Just go to more training and look it up. Yet I would be remiss if I let this podcast end without saying, Cody, what a great job you did with questions. Steve, thank you for the wonderful questions that you asked. Both of you are making a difference in this world, and we need more people like you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have received that. Thank you so yes. much. This has been wonderful, and we will list all of this on our Instagram as well, of a certain age. And Diana, once again, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Have a great thank time. You, Wow, what an interesting, intense, and I learned so much in this interview. I cannot wait to yes. circle back to the book, Cody. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to actually get into the book because it seems like the book is worth a reread because you learn things and you, uh, you absorb things and new things by reading things multiple times. And I am so excited to have learned about NLP. It is such an interesting perspective on how we can change and alter our mindset to become our best selves. What was your favorite part, Steve? You know, so many parts about the friendships that we cultivate and have in our circle, the changing the language. And I think that's kind of what you were talking about was one of my favorite things too. It sounds, you know, neuro-linguistic, right? But it's really just the brain and what language we use to impart and what we tell ourselves, the stories we tell ourselves and mm -hmm. the, the language that we actually put out there. And I just remember in the interview, the word depressed, we've all said that word. And I was saying in yeah. the interview, it's just a dead, heavy word with a period at the end of it where you can change that language immediately by I'm working through this. And how much more positive could your life be if you just changed it to that, where it's I'm working through this is I'm in a rough patch, but it's still action. It's depressed is an ending word. And so yeah. when you think of verbs and nouns and adverbs, I just think they really have an impact. And so there's so much more though. And I hope many people really pick up the book Becoming More because and use it as a workbook. I'm certainly going to be doing that. And um, Cody, this is our last episode for season one yes it is it's such a wonderful episode to end on too so for this season because we are definitely coming back y'all we are definitely coming back and we're going to be getting back into our interview seat to do a whole slew of new interviews with more interesting innovative thought-provoking guests that we really feel are important. And there's so many people to tap into and we're excited. Um, but yes, very excited about that. Stay tuned. Me too. You can always follow us to keep up with us on our Instagram page. Go to of a certain age pod, P-O-D, of a certain age pod, P-O-D. And if you are new to the show, you have 15 episodes to catch up on. So by the time you're done with them, we will be back with season two. So stay tuned That's for that. Right. And in the meantime, what are we doing? 
we're, we're living, living out, out loud. loud.